Hello, Holly. Hi, Sam. Welcome. Thank you. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you today? Good, thank you. Good. Uh, you have? Do you have um, some winter-specific headwear that I? Think? I do. It's a hand-loomed. Um, could be a scarf, but actually, it's a head warmer in my case, and I have some gloves. Wow. Okay. Fingerless middies. I keep my apartment fairly chilly. <laughs> well, that's good. Where is that hand loomed uh, item from? Um, from my daughter. Oh, it's really soft. What What is the now? I'm talking. You're talking to a um a person with a degree. Uh, it, in hand looming. I almost I almost pursued a graduate degree in textiles. Oh. So, I know. But not necessarily because I was into knitting. Um, right. 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 Because that is so broad. Textiles is so much. Right. I mean, I have a lot of uh, capabilities. And <laughs> might, those of you watching, you might not think, oh, geez, I really hope my school leader has a degree in sculpture and right. considered a career in textiles. I, I but, think it's amazing. Yeah. You get what you get and you don't throw a fit. That's what I say to my kids. <laughs> <laughs> and it works. <laughs> And it works. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. I see some. A few folks are still rolling in, uh, so we will we, we'll we'll keep up the banter for just another minute or two. Um, okay. Well, Holly, beautiful. Um, oh, thank you. I will tell her. Yeah, and I wonder, Holly. Someone asked me the other day um, how much I. Uh, well, I. Um, uh, I had to I had to build the house that I'm living in this past. Summer. I know. And uh, so someone said, "Did you think about where you wanted to zoom from when you were?" <laughs> <laughs> no, didn't construct yes, a room. Yes, this exact room. <laughs> right, did not construct a room for the zooming. Uh, oh. But I wonder in your home as you move in, because um, we're it's slowly becoming a home here. I might get a bookshelf yeah. up this week. Um, do you think about your background? Do you get to think, do you get to plan it out like the artwork behind you or? Yeah, my daughter did this too. Oh. Um, it's okay. a self portrait and let me see if I can get closer. Of she and her best friend without the glare. Mm -hmm. She and her best friend in maybe second grade when we moved back here from Connecticut. And she's the one with the browner skin. <laughs> oh, okay. Because she is browner. Yeah, yeah. That's her right there on this one. But you'll notice that both of them have brown shins. Yeah. So, I really like the, the active uh, nature of the, you know, those figures, they're not just holding still. No, no. They're moving. Oh no, yeah. They're dancing, yeah. She's yeah. moving. <laughs> uh, well, just before we start officially, I got a little bit dressed up. I put on the corduroy jacket. Oops. Um, both because it's quite cold where I am. Um, and uh, and I got feedback from the test audience here at my house uh, that the button up shirt was maybe a little too stuffy. So. Oh. <laughs> so in any case, I'm wearing a Montessori shirt. I'm uh, welcome. All of those uh, you of you who are here, uh, let's see, we are actively welcoming questions. Um, so remember down at the bottom is the Q&A box. So if you've got something on your mind, even if it's not a question, but perhaps a topic you'd like spoken about, um, please throw that into the Q&A down there. That will help us. Um, Sam, I did get a couple of questions during the week. I don't know if you got them as well. Oh, well, Holly, uh, I would love your help uh, uh, putting putting those together. So let me hear one second. Uh, I'm going to make uh, I'm going to make a slide where we put the questions. So um, this is lay them on. What, what questions have we gathered in this week? Uh, this week we have. Um, I'm wondering if we will find out if our students guide will return to in person learning or not. For me, that will be one of the major deciding factors, yeah. whether I send him in person or not. And then she says who her child is. Yeah, yeah. The so other one. Elementary family, yeah. The other one is about a parent who has um, 
severe underlying conditions and um, she wants support in her very difficult situation. She has a child in seventh grade. Um, so she won't be returning to in-person learning. As I have read, upper elementary kids are planned to return to in-person on April 12th. At this point, I don't see it as beneficial or wise to put the fourth grader through another transition to adjust to, especially since there's so little time left in the school year. Yeah. Um, and transportation isn't easy. And we have had difficult things to adjust to because of her health. Um, yeah. And she doesn't see forcing a short-term transition to in-person as being helpful. And, um, and that's it. She just so wants you to know if that. If I could sum up that question, yeah. um, would it be a phrase something like, why shift now with so little time left in the year? Yeah, I think that's part of it. But the other part is um, one of my children is not coming back because they're an adolescent and the other one is. Mm -hmm. um, but I have severe health concerns. Mm -hmm. And maybe, yeah, there's a context for that for sure. Maybe could they both stay at home? I'm not sure. Oh, of course. Right, I'm not right. exactly sure that's where she was going, but she wanted you to know that her situation is. Um, Precarious. I'm going to call that question the question of the week because oh, I think um, I think it is applicable uh, mm -hmm. specifically to uh, the work that we're doing right now, mm -hmm. and then I think um, uh, it is uh, part of the updates that I'll give again um, that, uh, that we we have we are following our timeline, so there's some things that will be happening. Um, uh, this week, where we're following our timeline uh, to, to get information out to families and such. Um, sure. And so I'll just, I'll make sure to cover those timelines also. Okay. But I think the question of the week really is, uh, why, for the elementary in particular, why shift right now with so little time left in the school year? Um, and I, I have a response to that, so I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Okay, so. then there's one in the Q&A. Oh, good, good, good. About the CDC new guidelines. Oh, yeah. Good, I'm glad Recognizing those Recognizing that MDH has not had a chance to update their policies yet. Yeah. And finally, Dave says, gee whiz, Sam, you're looking debonair. What about a scarf? Well, in fact, um, <clears throat> a, uh, a classic, um, what an what, uh, what, what, uh, what, uh, adolescent, uh, recent adolescent student named Oliver might say, the classic Sam O'Brien look would be <laughs> just to give myself a good old big hug with this this hand knit feature. That's it. Oh, right yeah. there. That's it. Yeah. Good. Whoops. It's falling down. It's falling oh, there down. you go. Yeah. I need a pin. I need the, uh, I have a wooden pin around here somewhere. Ooh. All right. Here we go. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, I do take fashion requests, even in the wind, <laughs> even not in the winter. Um, <laughs> but sometimes, sometimes it's cold. Sometimes a, a little wrap, wrap is appropriate. Uh, welcome uh, to the Great River School Family Forum. Uh, Holly and I have uh, filled the first few minutes, uh, hopefully, uh, with some non-directional talk that gets you comfortable. It is all by design, of course. Of course. The camera angle, the sound production, the lighting. Uh, there, I'm sure there's a design somewhere for some. And the of crew. The, and the crew, yeah. The crew, I mean, there's seven or eight folks back here with. Doing it all. No, there. It's just me and Holly, and frankly, uh, I think a lot of the pizzazz of these evenings are that. Holly and I, uh, just in all transparency, we are not meeting beforehand to iron out the agenda, the banter, or the talking points. And so um, we're trying to keep it uh, lively, I guess this I would say. This is raw material. <laughs> I, would, I would have chosen perhaps a more, um, uh, maybe a more sprightly adjective. Unplugged? Dynamic, yeah. Or um, you know, uh, happening before your eyes. <laughs> um, un, unprocessed. Unprocessed. It, it, yeah, yeah. It's a, um, you know, organically. What are those words that are easy to market these days? Um, what highly processed. It? I think highly processed is hard to market. Right. Yeah. Homogenized. Naturally, yeah, naturally occurring. Those, Pasteurized. You know. <laughs> this is unpasteurized. <laughs> this is an unpasteurized podcast. Uh, so those of you who are tuning in, I just want to make it clear. Holly and I are now giving you 
uh, truly unpasteurized love <laughs> and attention. And um, we're so glad you're with us. We're so glad, so glad you're with us. Uh, we <laughs> uh, are interested in both answering live questions. Um, and then I do have the weekly. Now, this is where I think if we had a production crew, there'd be like a theme music and a graphic oh. that would spin up. What I do have is, is a screen share, frankly. Oh, good. That will um, work. That'll work, yeah. Uh, so until we have a graphic, <laughs> I got a screen share. And what I'm going to share is both um, the weekly case counts, uh, which I believe, yeah, I believe we're updated. Uh, so we can look at those. Um, and then I can, I can give some verbal updates of all the behind the scenes work that is happening currently um, uh, at school. So uh, without further ado, Holly, here we That's go. Cool. Da, 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 da. The case counts. Um, that was my <laughs> apparently. Was apparently, mine. Mine was yeah, the ESPN show. theme is the uh, is the t is the TV theme I was I was going for. <laughs> All right, this week in the seven metro counties. Yeah, good. Uh, what we're looking at uh, here are the most recent reports for both um, uh, percent of test positive by county. Uh, again, we want to see this number for sure below 10%. And um, if possible, if it goes below 5%, we would enter uh, another stage of um, uh, more successfully community mitigated spread of this disease uh, that is causing this global pandemic. Um, and then down uh, below in the second count, Holly, when I zoom, uh, zoom around like this, do you see it better? I do. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, and I might even be able to, there we go, make it even better. Uh, and then so down here, also the case count for 10,000. Uh, again, folks, this is the, the easiest to share metric, but not the only metric. Um, however, it does give a good picture in terms of in all seven metro counties, uh, what's the trend, what's the, what's the stable trend, and uh, what's the overall incidence of cases per 10,000 people on a two week average. Um, and so uh, the, the easiest thing to say is that uh, cases are down again slightly from last week um, in all counties. And uh, if we continue to see this trend, uh, which we all, um, I'm sure if you're listening to any news source, you're hearing a lot of speculation on why nationwide is this kind of trend happening. Uh, if we continue to see this trend in Minnesota, I think it would indicate uh, effectiveness of both um, the impact of mitigation strategies like masking and social distancing. Um, and then also, uh, it's funny to me when I hear the national reports of seasonality uh, is no longer keeping people indoors. <laughs> well, it's keeping me indoors more than I wanna be. Uh, where I woke up last night, it was an air temperature of 37 below Fahrenheit Ooh. with a wind chill. Indeed. Um, Hopefully you were inside. Uh, I, I was outside. Did I say inside? 37 below outside where I woke up. Excuse yeah. me. No, it wasn't 37 below inside, but the propane, uh, it was so cold, the propane wouldn't flow. So um, I know you have to build a fire in the middle of the night when that doesn't happen. In any case, um, if we continue to see this, especially in the metro counties, uh, you would see us uh, start to consider and communicate about adjustments in the adolescent SRC. Um, and it still is it still is our goal and desire to see case counts very low and to see percent of tests positive by county very, very low. And I think that's that's going to be um, those would be two data points that would I think really allay a lot of folks concerns about pandemic and current state. Um, so uh, as I scroll down here, uh, this this graph just got so tiny. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. Ooh. What we're seeing here are graphs by county. And just a reminder to folks of how uh, quickly the numbers that where we're, where we're at right now, how quickly they went up extremely high. And so what we want to see again uh, is these numbers to come down low and then stay low. What we're, what we're saying in the fall was to stay uh, in the case of 10,000 uh, in the low teens or at or below 10. Um, we'd love to see that again, though with just a few months of school left, there are a few things um, that I'll talk about uh, in just a moment here that I want all families to keep in mind. Um, and so we'll keep reporting on these numbers. These still are uh, metro uh, area data points that really inform overall public health decisions. Um, but just as a reminder, if you haven't been uh, watching the Family Forum 
uh, too often. Here, I'll stop the share and make it a little cleaner. Um, uh, we are working toward an in-person learning model starting March 8th for the lower elementary and starting April 12th for the upper elementary. Uh, I want to identify that for the adolescent levels, uh, we currently do not have a date or um, plans to set a date uh, for adolescent level. That, However, that could change and we will keep you informed uh, as we know. What I do know is that, that at the adolescent level, we are uh, seeing, hearing, and um, uh, I think very soon enjoying uh, plans for outdoor meetups using um, uh, meeting all the state standards for health and safety and for, for school meetups, but then also uh, using the outdoors and social distance and masking as a way to create a more secure environment for adolescent students to have some meetups. And I also know that there are some preliminary plans occurring in terms of how and when to plan intensives for the spring. Um, so uh, we'll be in touch uh, as those plans develop and let you all know uh, about those for the adolescent level, especially. Um, Holly. Yeah. Um, let's see, is there anything else uh, that is important to note about, about business coming up that I failed to mention? Well, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A. Uh, one of them is about what's coming up. Um, besides the CDC new guidelines and MDH, the other question is, do we have an estimate on the number of kids on site when we start back up? Asking for a friend. Asking for a friend. <laughs> I'm I sure you are asking for, I'm sure they're asking for a friend. He's I'm always sure. asking for a friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll start sharing the screen here and then um, I'm going to take the Q&A. Okay. I'm going to take the Q&A. I'm going to copy the Q&A. Uh, oh, I can't copy the Q&A into our slides. I'll take, we'll, we'll answer the Q&A. Uh, I would like to just add as a theme tonight, two things, Holly. One okay. is I didn't hear about any um, acts of kindness, uh, <gasps> but I have, I have a couple that I observed to share. Did you happen to see any acts of kindness this past week? I'm sure of it. <laughs> so I will call on our audience, both live and all of those listening, please send Holly and I any noticings of acts of kindness. Doesn't have to be singing your own praises, though it could be. Uh, okay. Let us know about acts of kindness you participate in. Let us know about acts of kindness perhaps that you witness or see others participate in. And I we would like a, to- I gave a chocolate valentine to my mailman. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. I was gonna say, we'd like to amplify those acts of kindness. So here I'd like to amplify Holly's act of kindness for the US Postal Service <laughs> and chocolate. Yeah. Yeah, which could be a dicey thing, Holly. Did you clear with them that chocolate, sugar and treats are part of their scene? He was, he was very excited and put it in his pocket right away. So, you know, it was less than $20. And so I think it was okay. I'm not trying to bribe yeah. him. Okay, legally and nutritionally, probably okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. The dark chocolate, so it's good oh, for his heart. That's my favorite kind. Well, I was gonna say, I hope he's not like me and that isn't in his pocket still in the washing machine <laughs> or in front of the warm fire as you fall asleep and you wake right, up right. wondering, yeah. Uh, okay. In any case, uh, family forum for this evening, uh, we are gonna focus again some updates on working toward secure in-person learning for um, elementary and a Q&A for the community. Um, so uh, will it work? I think it will. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I see it has not updated from when I edited it. Uh, that's all right. I'll carry, I'll, we'll carry it off verbally. Um, so the updates this week, uh, as I said, adolescent guides and staff are really focusing on starting off the second semester, uh, staying in the distance learning model. Elementary guides met today. Um, uh, with an asynchronous day for their students, uh, general education guides and classroom assistants met today and made a lot of really good um, progress with each other, talking about potential student schedules and how to implement the formats that have been uh, winnowed down um, from, from the many ideas to a very uh, few solid ideas now that, focus, that people are focusing on and refining. Um, and I do think the question of the week uh, here is, uh, you know, why shift now with so little time left in the school year? Uh, it is a valid question. I can understand why that question is coming up. I think it came up last week and I answered it a little bit, um, but I'll answer it again. Uh, and so I do want to remind folks here just for a moment 
Good. Holly, um, our screen is needing some management. I wish we were in the same place, Holly. It looks fun. <laughs> I know. I have too many things on my screen. So just to remind folks, we didn't have school last Friday. Today was an asynchronous day. And again, we're working toward a time when all elementary staff, March through first through fifth, uh, can plan for this in-person return. Um, and again, some notes about Big Canoe. So if you haven't been contacted about Big Canoe or you want to make sure you have a Big Canoe spot, part of the RSVP form that we send out will have a Big Canoe box to check. Um, and uh, we have limited capacity for that March 1st through 5th. So if you're not part of the SRC zero model, um, there may not be room. And so just make sure that you've got some plans uh, in mind. If you think that's going to be a challenge for your family, and you're not sure if you qualify, um, then uh, wait for that survey to come out and then let us know if you don't see uh, something that you need there. Um, and then now Holly has, uh, there we go. Has it changed for you? Do you see elementary timeline and dates? Yes, I do. Okay, good. Um, and then again, this is a reminder from last week's news, but I want to make sure everyone sees it. Uh, our lower elementary model has saved the date for March 8th, 2021 uh, for offering in-person Montessori education for lower elementary students and continuing with the distance learning program. And then starting April 12th, which is the first Monday after spring break, uh, an upper elementary model for in-person learning on site. And then of course, also continuing distance learning for anyone who chooses that. Um, and then overall the timeline, I just wanna let folks know that uh, we've been working, uh, I would say diligently, I wouldn't say feverishly, I caught someone <laughs> saying that. And I think pandemic wise, it's just a bad time for a couple phrases, um, yes. you know, a bad time to say that something went viral. Uh, also, I think, <laughs> Even making that joke last spring was way too soon, and I don't think yeah. it flies so well right now. Yeah. Um, but then also saying that we've been working feverishly is, if, if we were working feverishly, we should have been working at home for two weeks yeah. alone, basically. Separated, yes. Yeah, so we've been working diligently. Good. And specifically, we've been working diligently uh, to prepare these scenarios and options for families. Um, and then I just met today with a group of folks who are uh, part of the COVID advisory. They volunteered. Um, this past summer or this fall or even recently to be part of uh, the working groups on um, establishing the way that we're going to engage as a community. And then from those working groups uh, and through a couple other calls for volunteers, uh, people have volunteered to be part of this COVID advisory that meets about every six weeks, though it's been more often these past, this past month and a half. Uh, and this focus group talked about surveys. And so specifically, um, we're, we are going to have an RSVP form for lower L families that's going to go out uh, I believe this Friday. And um, as it goes out, we'll be able to communicate specifics of options for your family. There'll be an optional second part of this survey where you can let us know qualitative reasons about why you're making the decision you're making, either to um, come in in-person for in-person learning or to stay uh, in the distance learning model. And so um, if you're tuning in tonight to get specifics, uh, I am not jumping the uh, cart in front of the horse. I'm not going to give all the specifics that I think are likely, but I can just say a few things tonight. Um, uh, and, and all the details will be shared then uh, when that RSVP survey uh, is released to families. And if it's available beforehand, it will be. But just to identify that, um, we're continuing to monitor health data as we approach in-person plans. Holly, I received a comic from somebody um, who uh, shared it with me. And I thought the comic explained a perspective that some families, especially the ones I think who are asking questions about, why are we shifting? Like what's going on? Yeah. Um, and even for other folks who I think are, are just seeing the news and the possibility of um, coronavirus and wondering why are schools working so hard to open up? I'm gonna mm -hmm. share the comic really for levity. But um, first it's, not, it's not a research point. Tell me when you see it, do you see it? I see it. So um, the comic here uh, sent, to, I think forwarded to me, I think it was a cartoon in the New Yorker uh, mm -hmm. today. The logic of lifting coronavirus restrictions applied to your life is the header. Mm -hmm. So your house is on fire, so blow out your birthday candle and call it a day. Um, I would actually take the approach uh, that um, this, is, this, this is not how uh, I'm seeing or we at school are seeing the approach to the coronavirus response we're having, but specifically, uh, I want to identify that there are some goals we're working through 
And specifically, uh, I want to identify that the move to try to establish an option for in-person learning is not to decide that that's better than distance learning. And so we're picking winners and we're just going to um, we're just going to have half of our community win and half the community uh, lose something. In fact, we have been only offering a distance learning model for quite some time now. It'll be um, almost a year uh, when we do start lower elementary for the option of in-person learning on March 8th. And um, as we are starting that, one thing I do see that I think is important to identify is that um, it's, fair, it's fair for me to share, I think, that uh, our guides and our staff uh, in the elementary level um, had the opportunity these past couple of weeks to uh, suggest ideas and ways to approach the in-person learning challenge. Um, we've also offered uh, pathways in a short period of time for uh, staff to identify both popular models and less supported models in terms of all the suggested ways we could approach this uh, challenge of how do you serve distance learners and how do you serve in-person learners uh, while staying both prepared um, and I think realistic as an adult about how much labor we're capable of. Um, I'm going to share a little bit more about that process when I'm able to share details about the models next week. Um, but specifically, I want to identify that we're doing everything we can to provide options to staff and families. And that up until this point, by only offering distance learning, uh, we have been waiting for a more secure time to plan in-person learning. And uh, I don't have graphics to share tonight, but I believe by next week uh, I will have some where I can identify that uh, to go back to that first question of um, why, <laughs> uh, which I think is right here, right? Why the shift now with so little time left in the year? Uh, specifically, I wanna identify that right now is the best time to plan an in-person model for several reasons. First off, to identify that we don't know when this pandemic will be declared over. And secondly, we're not sure, in fact, when the pandemic will start to have uh, a greatly reduced presence in the lives of all of our students or our staff. Uh, we hope and we look forward to uh, vaccine distribution, making folks much more secure and comfortable. Uh, however, I recognize and I think that the best advice that we were getting as a school from epidemiologists, from state health officials, uh, and frankly, from state education officials, is that what we've learned over the past year in this pandemic is that we should prepare for the most challenging situation and then hope for the least challenging situation, right? So uh, by preparing for the most challenging situation, what I identify now is that it's not easier for teachers, especially after this school year, to wait to the summer to plan for an in-person learning model. It's also um, not assured that when we are planning for the fall that we're gonna for sure be able to go in person with no restrictions. In fact, it's likely we're gonna be social distancing, we're gonna be masking, and we're gonna be having many of the same tenor and tone of conversation that we're having now about returning in the fall of 2021. Now, I'm not trying to be dire. I don't wanna ruin anyone's you know, evening doing dishes if you're listening to this. If you tuned in you know, just for the debonair appearance, <laughs> and the banter. We'll get to that again before the hour is over. But uh, right now, we have information that is reliable in terms of schools that have operated in person and how and why we can operate in person securely. And that security means uh, a mitigated and greatly reduced chance of contracting coronavirus in a work setting. So because teachers and educators and uh, early childhood and childhood care providers have all been named to um, the, uh, uh, excuse me, group 1B to receive vaccines, I see the state is naming uh, our work as, as essential frontline, expected to go back as soon as possible work as a state. And I think that social pressure to address um, is, is not solely or primarily a political uh, approach. I, I think that there is a real need that has to be addressed about families who, um, again, like we've said last week and the week before, are experiencing a kind of risk in social and educational isolation that can't be discounted. And so right now what we're doing, serving students in distance learning is working for some folks. And our goal is 
to serve now in-person learners and distance learners in a way that both meets our mission and vision. So, oh, there we go, next. Um, we're not trying to blow out birthday candles and imagine the pandemic isn't happening. In fact, we are applying very consistent, uh, stringent health standards on campus. And I just wanna be really clear with all families. Um, when we say three foot distancing, we say mask wearing, we mean we're gonna be working every day at all times for that to be the guideline that's followed. And of course we expect to be able to work on that. So with students ages six to 11 uh, or seven to 12, possibly being on campus altogether by the end of the spring, uh, we identify that the way schools have been safe in other settings is not through perfect 100% compliance with the guidance. Uh, in fact, it is doing our best with the guidance and then having routine checklists, having visits from school nurses and observers to see how we're doing and what we could do better. And we do actually have a track record on site. Our student resource center, the on-campus place where students have been doing distance learning, we have had positive COVID cases on site. And those positive COVID cases have not spread on site from one positive person to any other people in our community. Meaning people with COVID have been at the SRC this past six months. Uh, and both they've been, an, they've, whether they've been adults or they've been students, they've been in the setting following the safety guidelines. When they experience a symptom, they go home or they report it and are assessed. And when they get their test back, we know how to do contact tracing. We know how to get people to quarantine. I expect all of those learning experiences and those successfully implemented measures to be used not only this spring, but likely again, possibly in the fall, whether it's a variant, whether it's we find that our current vaccines are not as effective in the long term as we thought they were. We want to be prepared as a school, not only now in this spring, but in the fall, next winter, and next spring, whether it's a change in the virus, a change in the vaccine schedule, or a change in, in some external um, uh, characteristic of our experience that we're not in control of, we want to be prepared in what we are in control of, which is we can control how we set rules at school. We can, um, to an extent, control children's behavior at school, and we can definitely train in adults at school. And we are very successful at getting uh, a successful compliance with safety rules at school such that most students will follow most of the rules almost all of the time. And when there are exceptions, we also know how to respond. So families shouldn't expect sending a student back because they will always, with no exception, be six feet apart from everybody. In fact, following MDH guidelines, students would be three feet apart from each other. And again, most of the time. And what we find is that the Department of Health and the Center for Disease Control have been very clear that following those rules to the best of our ability has successfully kept kids safe on campus. It has also successfully kept adults pretty secure. And so I just wanna be clear that we aren't picking winners right now. We're not saying, well, distance learning wins and that's why we're doing it. We're in fact saying to continue in only distance learning this year would leave us not only, I think, underprepared and underserving students this year, but we'd be underprepared for next year. And we'd also, I think, be underprepared for how to get through next year because it's likely there are going to be unexpected bumps in the road. So that's not necessarily a, you know, who hooray sales pitch, but I think it's a realistic assessment of where we're at. And so um, I also wanna identify uh, one of the things that um, I've been saying, oh, Oh, there we go, those are the questions. Uh, I wanna identify one of the, there we go. Uh, one of the questions that often has come up, uh, Holly, that um, I didn't notice come up this week by email, but was asked back in December was, um, what about guides? What about employees uh, that are uh, trying to make a decision about, about working in person or is everybody really comfortable with this decision? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just wanna be really honest and clear right now. Um, at Great River School, we have offered uh, any adult the opportunity to request an accommodation. And if an adult has a health condition that qualifies them for uh, being an at-risk group uh, as qualified by the CDC, um, then uh, we work through that, that process of accommodating those needs and then finding a way for that person to continue their work at school. Now, however, we're not restricting the request for accommodation only to that group. 
We have been clear since the beginning of the year that any adult could request an accommodation and we're gonna prioritize first adults with underlying health conditions and second adults with people in their lives, usually dependents who need their care and those uh, employees don't wanna put those dependents or household members at risk. Um, and so we even have folks in that category too. And here's what I see is that families want to know that the adults at school feel totally comfortable, ready to go to work and have not, uh, have not been compelled to go to work or had, had their arm twisted. Adults feel really obligated to show up for their community. And so there's a tension that I think comes from the same place of care. Families really care about the adults in their kids' lives and really want to do everything they can to accommodate those adults. Adults really care about the students and the learning community. And as we've seen, the learning community on the whole isn't giving a clear answer about wanting just one thing. Half of our students want to be in person, half of our students want to continue in distance learning. That's the rough estimate. Uh, per classroom, it looks a little bit different uh, depending on what classroom you're in. So, you know, it varies from 40% from to a little over 60% of students wanting in-person learning per each elementary classroom right now. The reason we see moving forward toward in-person learning models that also serve distance learners right now is worthwhile. Uh, for me, from, from a school-wide and long-term point of view, is that uh, right now we have the availability of planning time, uh, some already planned days for professional development, and I think a real social pressure to uh, be in person. And if, if a variant comes up and we learn that uh, classrooms are not as secure as they were a week ago or a month ago before the variant, then we can go into distance learning. And also everyone should be prepared for the possibility of quarantining if there's a positive COVID case because we are living through a pandemic. Uh, however, as we move forward, I'm just going to screen share for a moment again. Holly, what's going on? I have a question about Thank your you. slides. Yeah. Um, not this one, but the timeline slides yeah. where you have dates yeah. listed in a row. For those people who write things down like I do so yeah. that I can answer questions of people who call, yeah. Yeah. for instance. Yeah. Um, yeah, this uh, that one, no, the one before, yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. When you look at March one to five. Yeah. It's that's incorrect. There's no elementary. There's no school. There's no school. Yeah, thank you. For elementary. We're recycling a slide from before the, the most okay. uh, just, updated update. I had an issue last week and I want to make sure that I have it right. <laughs> Good. So, um, uh, here we can we can correct that. And also this slideshow that I'm in uh, is a copy of the slideshow that's available for everyone to comment on and also linked currently on our website. Um, so ha having talked through those the, points, what's is that? that under the greatriverschool.org slash return? Yes, and at the very top under last week's video. And we'll just, okay. we're gonna keep it there for a while. Okay. Oh, yep. And then so uh, just one just one more one more screen share. Uh, just, I think, to keep us clear, um, that, that, that point that I want to make about our, our, uh, the adults at our school um, and the families at our school both wanting some assurances, uh, I, I think we're at a time in which our assurances really rely on us being direct and open with each other about um, our experiences and our needs. And so I'll say this, we have divergent needs in our learning community, and those divergent needs have pressured the adults at school who are educators to have to make a decision on, do I take an accommodation and necessarily change my role in the lives of my students? Uh, and, or do I come in person to learn and make some hard decisions about how to make peace with that security? Because showing up to school um, is a little bit less secure than, um, most of the choices most of the adults who work at Great River School are making. And uh, I just wanna be plain about that. However, uh, I have seen even, even folks who have had accommodations requested and in starting to plan to accommodate them. Um, one of the reasons that I see folks uh, actually decide to not take the accommodation is because they don't wanna shift their role, even for this, even just for the interim period of this spring um, in, the, in their classroom. And so they're deciding to come in or to uh, do, an, do an interim time in which they need to wait till they're vaccinated 
uh, or their household is vaccinated, and then they're willing to come in. So I want to applaud, though, our elementary director, Jean Peters, for working through, uh, I would say, a, a fraught and really challenging set of questions and answers with the elementary staff. Um, and I want to applaud the elementary staff and, and employees for, I think, not only being open and direct about what we need to do together to make this work for everybody, um, but hopefully uh, feeling heard in voicing both concerns and questions they need answered as a group in order to come back uh, with confidence. So that was a lot, that was a lot to say. Uh, by next week, I look forward to being able to review and share both the models. And when we send out the RSVP later this week, there'll be a very succinct video explaining the models and the details. Um, just a couple things that I know is that the models being developed, uh, classroom guides who are currently lead teachers in the classroom um, remain in those roles being the lead teacher um, with uh, a couple exceptions. If a classroom guide is not showing up for in-person lessons um, because they need an accommodation, they are shifting their role to have, to have a different distance learning support role with those who are remaining in distance learning and an interim person will fill that role. However, at this point, uh, the interim roles will be filled um, with uh, Montessori trained folks who are either known to the classroom already, uh, could be an assistant who's Montessori trained and will step up and do lessons, um, or in the interim could be um, uh, a Montessori trained person uh, who knows already our school and the students uh, who, who shifts into teaching for that interim time. So uh, again, details on that will be shared, including specifics on which classrooms uh, might include some folks who are taking, needing to have accommodations in order to uh, shift their role. Holly, did I see you had your hand up? No, I was, I was saying um, uh, yeah. about the guides in elementary being heard. I was yeah. clapping. Yay. Oh, oh, well, I, I just want to also identify you're hearing from the person who is um, known by that uh, known, known by that um, very difficult five syllable word often uh, rhymes with Mississippi. Mississippi. Well, I was going to say rhymes with um, administrator. Oh, yes. Yeah, and I don't think um, I'm not I'm not uh, attempting to be an administrator here speaking for the greater faculty. So I just want to make that very clear. Uh, okay. I also want to identify that uh, the question that I received from a family was, uh, we're really excited for in person learning. We just want assurance that the guides are really excited for it, too. Mm -hmm. And I, I got to say, um, I know that our guides feel a deep sense of joy and responsibility for their roles in the classrooms. And um, while not all guides feel joy, uh, we have worked through, I think, an earnest, honest, and open process where folks are able to request accommodations. And I think the way we're gonna get through this year is being direct with each other. So for folks who are ready uh, to do distance learning, um, most of our guides are planning on uh, returning. And with very few exceptions, the guides who need accommodations have plans to return when uh, they or a family member that needs it is vaccinated. Um, I look forward to the state really getting support from the federal government and getting many more vaccination uh, appointments available to teachers. And I know right now what is holding the state back is the supply of vaccine. Um, so the state is in section 1B right now in terms of uh, priority list for vaccinations. So 1A uh, generally has been complete or is reported to be complete. And 1B, which is still folks 65 and older and folks who work in uh, childcare education. When 1B is done, which is really the push right now statewide, then they'll move on to vaccinating folks in 1C and then in another tier. And so um, that's where I recognize the real investment in making sure that teachers and schools are able to operate in person. I think the state is pushing for that. And I, and I, st I still think though that families this spring and next fall as well as adults are going to feel less than total relief in terms of the pandemic. I think there's still gonna be anxiety about it. And I still think we will be implementing many, if not all of the uh, preparations on campus for distancing and for um, uh, mask wearing, for air filtration, for hand washing, and for just keeping in mind 
all the ways that we're going to keep each other as secure as possible during this global pandemic. So here are a couple of the questions um, that came in that came in this past week. Uh, finding out if students' guide is returning in person or not. So in the elementary, uh, I know that the school model being used is that distance learners and in-person learners stay in their classroom community. Uh, the goal is that distance learners' schedules um, serve the same outcomes that they serve right now, though those schedules may need to adjust a bit. Uh, the landmarks in a distance learner schedule I know include um, the morning meeting, uh, community meeting, and then lessons. I think that distance learners experience will still include those things. Um, the thing that is new now is that in-person instruction will occur on campus in the classroom community. And um, for the couple classrooms right now where guides are considering uh, needing accommodations to not be in person. Um, we, do, we do have folks known to that classroom uh, or known to the elementary community already ready to step in in the interim until those lead teachers are able to come back. And there's just a couple teachers among the classrooms right now who are considering that. Um, however, among the 12 classrooms, to only have a couple teachers still considering that I think is, is important. And I think it's also important to know that um, we are, we are working with folks to try to make it as clear as possible that it's a time of fraught responsibilities. And we don't want anyone to be putting themselves in a position of um, being forced. I hear the word being forced used a lot, though I do think right now um, there are pressures on us. And so I just want to, I don't want to undercut the idea uh, that we've had to make some of those decisions. I also want to say, um, folks are really excited for in-person learning uh, because it's one of the reasons we really like having a school. <laughs> we like being outside together. We like being apart from each other. Sometimes we like breaks from school, uh, but people also like being there, being in the building, being on campus and doing the activities. Um, so we are ready to follow all of the Department of Health uh, guidelines from the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, students and adults um, and all the distancing and masking and air, uh, air mitigation rules will be followed. And you can see all of those published by the Minnesota Department of Health and Education right now, anywhere on the internet. Um, also though specifically, we're gonna have some specific ways to check in on classrooms. And these are the kinds of specifics I think I'm gonna be ready to share next week, but I don't wanna share them with you all now ahead of the staff having, having been really able to come to some conclusions, having their answers, uh, their, their questions answered about those things. Um, so now, Holly, how about off to the Q&A? Let's go to the Q&A. Let's go to the Q&A. Now there's three. Do you oh, feel wonderful, like, wonderful, wonderful. Yes. Um, like CDC answer? new guidelines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Recognizing that MDH has not had a chance to update their policies yet. Yeah, well, so I, I was just in a call today about that. Uh, for those of you who haven't been uh, on the cutting edge of news about schools and guidelines, the Center for Disease Control uh, last Friday the 12th released a highly anticipated, excuse me, updated guidelines. And um, specifically, those guidelines uh, identify um, some more specifics about classroom preparation, um, some, some more specifics about uh, social distancing using the phrase of as much as possible. Um, and then uh, also, I think some real clear guidance and specifics uh, about how to open uh, with vaccines being part of the strategy, but not the leverage point or key before anyone can be in person. Um, uh, the Department of Health and Education are reviewing those and uh, they, the Department of Health did make a couple language adjustments to their, to their guidelines last Friday. So there are a couple things in the safe learning plan for schools updated on February 12th. Uh, but the Deputy Commissioner of Education um, reported to charter school leaders today that the Department of Health and Education have a meeting this week to make those revisions and then possibly um, will be releasing, if any substantial revisions are made, releasing them early next week. Uh, the, the main, uh, I would say, criteria difference that, that appears when you read the CDC updated guidelines is that the CDC um, has in the past cited uh, three foot distancing for students as being shown to be effective in other schools. Um, that is not uh, dis discounted, but it's not part of the guidance either. So six foot distancing to the extent possible 
with an emphasis on bringing students back in person is the CDC guidance. And as interpreted by the Department of Health and Department of Education today, again, uh, something that we will follow is we will social distance as much as possible and really follow as a guideline the minimum social distance between students at school in the elementary setting will be three feet as we go back in person. And then uh, between adults and adults, that's going to be six feet as a standard. And so we've been working on both um, reminder markings and, and work mats uh, to let students know about their three foot workspace and their safe space, um, but then also uh, making sure that um, we're making sure that adults and families and students are going to be really clear on what those measures are when we're going to be uh, on, on campus together. A question about uh, an estimate for the number of kids on site when we start back up. So to be specific, Holly, I think this is just about the elementary. Yes. Yeah. yeah. However, yeah. Well, yes, I can yes. say for the elementary uh, that according to survey results, and put, putting those survey results with comments, it does seem to us that uh, half the students overall in the elementary will be planning to come back in person. I've shown some graphs in the past. I won't screen share back to them now, um, but I think three weeks ago, we really focused on uh, graphs specifically uh, showing that um, the folks who are uh, qualifying for free and reduced lunch, um, and any folks who are uh, from families who uh, have essential workers in their family or critical workers, uh, by an overwhelming amount, the critical worker families, and then by a two thirds amount, the uh, free and reduced lunch families will be planning to send their students in person. But overall, we would expect half. And again, in each classroom, uh, at least in the lower and upper elementary, in some classrooms, that's 20 to 22 kids per room, and some classrooms, that's 12 to 14 kids per room. Uh, I will say this, that by rearranging the rooms and using some distancing strategies, uh, I know a few upper elementary classrooms are already set up to fit uh, over 25 kids, um, and that we do have strategies if all the students were to come back to meet the three-foot distancing guidelines and to keep the classrooms cohorted together. Um, also, one thing to notice uh, that's really important, I think, is that um, adolescents, uh, especially as these case numbers go down and as our local testing among our staff is able to show that we don't have a prevalence of asymptomatic cases, um, we will be looking to bring adolescents back into the SRC model uh, for sure. And so th those numbers will also be increasing. Um, one will be a best time to communicate with kids about the change of learning model. Thank you so much for asking. Uh, our social workers and our school psychologists um, and our educators have been working together to create a wellness and welcoming document. Um, some of the highlights that I can share here verbally, uh, just before um, what, it, what I do plan on next week is giving both specifics and an overview, and then I think uh, answering the questions that have come in. Uh, but specifically, um, we're going to give some guidance for students, especially say new first years who have never been on campus in a typical way, uh, opportunities to visit the campus before in-person learning begins so they can see what the classroom will look like and have an experience that is a little bit more like a return to school that happens in typical fall. Um, and so uh, I would communicate about the model shift um, after you have all the details. And I would say um, basically uh, late this week, it would be an early time and say a week from today or middle of next week would be a later time to communicate. Uh, again, a reminder that there is no school for elementary March 1st through 5th. And a second reminder that March 1st through 5th is closer than you think it is because it's February. And so uh, we have always planned for two days of staff development next week, the last two school days of February. And so effectively, if you, in case you haven't put this together yet, for the elementary school, there will be no school Thursday Friday, and then the following Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So there are seven non-school days for a total of, yes, 11 days in a row with no school. Um, so we're, we're all for you making sure you've got some things planned for that time. And we are still prepared to take SRC zero qualifying families for childcare during that time. And that will be in the model. Um, the reason I say late this week or early next week to communicate with students is because 
I suggest that when we do share these details with you as a family about the options, uh, I just wanna make clear that we have listened to the feedback we received in December. Um, and then I would say also the really critical points that people identified about the importance of learning in the learning community students are in, whether they're in distance learning or in person, the importance of having uh, the adults in their life that have been in their life already, whether they're in person or in distance learning. And so we're looking for ways to make sure we value that critical feedback and make sure that those are some foundational points for how we uh, make sure these models are available. So uh, when we do ask for an RSVP, it's going to be asking for uh, an initial RSVP. And then for the lower elementary, there will be times through the spring where you can opt into distance learning, or excuse me, where you can opt into in-person learning. Uh, and for the upper elementary, again, that first day is April 12th there'll be another time in May when you could opt in to in-person learning. Um, and at any point we would be ready if we needed to, to take a quarantine break. Uh, heard that if we travel during the 11 days off, we will be required to quarantine before returning. Uh, well, according to current recommendations that we are following from the Department of Health, that is the recommendation. Can you specify what qualifies as travel? Um, driving to a family cabin up north does not seem the same as staying at hotels or flying on planes. You are exactly correct. And uh, very specifically, please work with us if you have a qualifying detail um, and, and, and uh, you need to make some kind of request for an exception to that uh, policy that we have. But as a protocol, we would like you to follow the recommendations right now, which is that if you travel, and so specifically, especially if you travel to another place outside of the state of Minnesota, um, and especially if you do anything that involves a plane, uh, a shared space with people that you don't know, uh, visiting a highly populated place, we do expect families to take a quarantine period upon returning and follow all the protocols for testing. Um, and then as a heads up, uh, we are working on um, the details of possibly guiding families to plan to obtain tests uh, in that time period between February 25th and March 5th. Uh, the, any tests for the state of Minnesota right now are free. Um, you are able to access uh, through Vault Health Minnesota, for instance, tests that are shipped to your home. You're able to do this live a test with a doctor on a video and then send it back. Um, we are working to make sure that we're giving all the right directions to families about how to do that. Uh, but that's possible that we would want to ask all families to be tested in, in one of the free no charge ways that the state of Minnesota makes uh, available. And then uh, just to emphasize too, we do host testing sessions for all staff every two weeks. One of those was held today. Holly, anything else? Yeah, that's what I was gonna bring up because you had mentioned earlier um, staff who are asymptomatic mm -hmm. and how we keep track of that. So yep. I want, just wanted you to mention that we are testing staff. Oh, right, right, we are testing staff. If we find a staff member uh, is asymptomatic but positive, we do have a protocol to follow for everyone that's been near and around, we would let you know, like any positive COVID case, we'd let you know right away. Uh, what we have had so far though, are many negative tests, which is great news for us. So, um, and to be very clear, when a staff member is tested at school, uh, we send those tests back. We find out if there's been a positive case. Um, and however, uh, the staff's medical and personal information is secure to them. Um, so, uh, we have, have kept community spread at zero cases so far, which I think, again, demonstrates our effective ability to implement these mitigation strategy, strategies. And I see one last question here, Holly. Will you read this one? I see it. Yeah. I'm Kim, if our child doesn't return on March 8th, yeah. can they jump in anytime? Or are there specific dates for joining in person later? Yeah. And so I just want to thank everybody for your patience with not sharing the information yet because it's just, it's just not quite baked. It's like, take, it's like baking muffins and taking them out too early. And you just wish that you had done it right. And so we're just doing it right. We're just, we're holding that information till we know that staff can review it before we send it out to everybody else. So it'll be clearer when we're able to share this with everyone. But um, if your lower elementary student chooses distance learning on March 8th, you will have an opportunity to opt in to in-person learning later, likely on April 12th. Um, so for your upper elementary student, if you don't choose to come in person on April 12th, there will likely be a time in May when you can opt into coming. 
Uh, you won't be able just at any time to decide to come in person uh, be, because generally the way we're preparing the physical environment, the way we're preparing our staffing and response and, um, and, and the way that we're preparing to best support those learning communities means that we have to know who's gonna be there. Um, and so, so uh, that's, that's that. <laughs> but um, when we do send the RSVP out later this week, um, this is hot off the presses today from working with our uh, COVID advisory about the surveys. Uh, when we do send the RSVP later this week, there'll be a very simple section to RSVP. There'll be an optional second section associated with your answer, qualitatively asking if you're choosing distance learning, you know, what's working for you? What are the reasons you've chosen it? Um, is there anything you're looking to develop? Uh, and if you've chosen in-person learning, um, you know, is there anything that's on your mind? Are there priorities that you think uh, you want us to know about? And are there, are there suggestions or questions you have? Um, in all cases, to make very clear, uh, the students who are participating at Great River School stay in their classroom learning community. Um, and with, with very few exceptions, the same adults who teach them in person stay in their lives and as their primary uh, source of instruction for distance learners too. Uh, we are also though in the background making sure that the distance learning experience is still high quality uh, and that our teachers are not trying to do two, two exceptional things at once, which means we are likely to have additional um, distance learning supports, but the classroom community and the teacher for that student stays in their classroom community. So if I'm a Minnesota River student and I stay in distance learning, I'm still a Minnesota River student. I still have instruction from Minnesota River adults, the same adult who's instructing the Minnesota River in-person kids. So, um, and you will be able to partner up distance learning and in-person together using technology. Um, and actually, well, I'm just, I'm just noticing the chats from uh, our esteemed colleague, Wendy Fisher. Wendy is here. Wendy, um, I'm gonna just uh, promote you to talk, promote you to be a panelist. Um, I didn't notice that first chat that you're, you're prepared. Uh, so if you're willing to be a panelist, Wendy, come on in if you wanna share a few of the details from today's working session, just as we're wrapping up our hour. So I'm just walking in the door from my commute from Great River School Yay! back to South Minneapolis. Yay! And walking through my house into a private spot where my pets aren't um, grappling with one another. <laughs> so Sam, how about if you set me up and ask me some questions? Okay, um, uh, Wendy, um, what are the, the known highlights that we can share with the community uh, of elementary families today of what happened uh, in the lives of planning for teachers today? So a couple of things. One, the number one question I have heard from families is will my child stay with their classroom cohort no matter which model we choose? Yep. And I'll reiterate what Sam said, that is also the number one priority of the educators. When we gave them a vast array of choices, how do you want this model to look? They said the number one thing we care about is keeping the students in their cohorts with their classroom colleagues. And so that, that I think was a wonderful way to see the alignment of family values and needs and our educator values and needs. Yeah. And That's then, it. yes. And then the other thing I had, because I'm there at school, um, I had the opportunity to do walkabouts numerous times a day and check in with a lot of our folks who were in these planning meetings today and just pop in and say, how are you feeling? Like, does this feel good to you? Are you excited? Are you nervous? Yeah. Um, does this work feel purposeful? And to even the folks who had started the day, very trepidatious and um, you could see the anxiety on their faces in the Zoom calls. Yeah everyone reported back doing, and this all, all you Montessori parents will love this, <laughs> doing purposeful work together has made us feel normalized. <laughs> like we, we feel a whole new sense of peace and um, purpose and you know, shared vision. And I think we finally crossed, Jean and I did a kumbaya moment at the end of the day after all these meetings and really felt confident that we had crossed crossed a line today. Well, that's great. So those are a couple of things I can report. Well, wonderful. Uh, those are those are excellent highlights. Um, 
In fact, I feel like that's 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 the summary I think we should close with, because uh, I don't know if you heard Wendy, but I was very realistic about answering the question of, you know, we're excited to send our kid back as long as the guides are just as excited as us. And so, you know, probably better boundaries are people have made some real hard decisions, but I have been uh, just exceptionally impressed by the the willingness and ability for folks to do purposeful work together and find joy in it, even even in times like this. So. Great. Okay. Well, thanks, Wendy. Thanks. Thanks for thanks inviting me. Holly. Yeah. And uh, thanks everybody else. If you ever have a question, please send it to us at office at greatriverschool.org. And, uh, and just at the end of this week, we'll be sharing. What's that, Holly? And if you see an act of kindness. And please share your acts of kindness. Please, 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 please. Um, and then, and then uh, specifically, toward the end of this week, we'll be able to share some of those specifics from the model that the guides have been working on with elementary families. Uh, and then um, I believe next week, we'll focus on both specifics and Q&As from that. So thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Bye.